Welcome, my fellow worshippers of Adam, to this week's sermon where I round off the coverage of my energy weapons. I am Rad King, King of the Rads, and we are going to take a look at the lore, obscure details, and design inspiration for as many energy weapons as we can. This is part two of my miscellaneous energy weapons series, for all those weapons that didn't fit into nice little categories like laser or plasma. So, turn up the rads, and don't be sad while we give the last of the energy weapons their due. I always have a comment highlight at the end of my long form videos, so if you want to see me react to the comments some of you leave on my videos or discord, stick around to the end. Let's kick this off with one of the hardest hitting energy weapons in the series, the Tesla Cannon. First appearing in Fallout 3, this large shoulder mounted weapon does beastly damage and looks fantastic to boot. This weapon is pre-war in origin, as the Fallout New Vegas magazine called Future Weapons Today mentions the Tesla Cannon on the cover. It reads, Light and compact Tesla Cannons, implying that Tesla Cannon technology wasn't necessarily new to the pre-war world, but the miniaturization of the technology was. After all, a magazine called Future Weapons Today will only be interested in new and upcoming technology, rather than old weapon and tech. Although it was a pre-war weapon, it can only be used and found once one completes the broken steel quest called Shock Value. Shock Value has the player recover a piece of advanced and experimental technology that they just refer to as a Tesla coil, and it is retrieved from the old only power works after powering down the station. It is not specified what makes this Tesla coil so much more advanced than any other Tesla coil, since that's not exactly new technology. But upon returning to the Brotherhood of Steel, it seems to be a critical missing piece of the weapon, because it's only after completing this mission that the weapon can be found and used. The Tesla coil that you recover looks like this, and two of them are visible on the design of the weapon on either side of the electrified chamber. I'm not an electrical engineer, but this looks nothing like what I expect when I hear the word Tesla coil. Continuing the DLC to Adams Air Force Base will provide the player with up to 11 different Tesla cannons, which are very effective weapons. Firing a large, electric, for lack of a better term, beam, the beam itself will do a base 40 damage. That's not all that impressive. However, there's an electric explosion once the beam hits a hard surface, dealing 80 damage. The fun does not stop there, however, since enemies in the area of effect will go on to take residual damage from the arcing electricity to the tune of 20 extra damage for 2 seconds. That gives this weapon enormous potential per shot, and can be very effective when attacking enemies in groups. Big damage does come at a price though, as this weapon uses a rather long reloading animation as well, reducing the weapon's DPS. Although the weapon is very effective when targeting even the most heavily armored enemies, a scripted effect unique to the Tesla Cannon causes the weapon to be even deadlier to vertebrates. Using the Tesla Cannon is a guaranteed one shot when used against vertebrates, no matter the health of the vertebrate or the damage output of the cannon. This is a good indication that the weapon was originally intended as an anti-vehicle weapon. And when you consider it a large electric shock that can cause power surges and short circuiting in a motorized vehicle, seems like it would be a pretty good way to immobilize it. There's one hidden variant in Fallout 3, named simply the Tesla Cannon Beta, and with a name like that, the use of this weapon leaves little to the imagination. It uses the model of the missile launcher, meaning that the shoulder supported design was intended from the very start, and this beta version has the same kind of attack as the in-game version, with a direct beam, explosion, and residual shock ability. The direct beam damage is cut in half though, sitting at 20, and it is over double the weight of the in-game version. This can be found beyond the map boundary near the satellite relay station, which is where Liberty Prime gets primed by the Enclave, if you catch my drift. On PC, you can easily clip through the boundaries with console commands, but if you're on console, you still have a chance since you can use exploits to get over the map boundary, like the ammo cartridge ladder exploit. Look it up on the wiki if you're interested in knowing how to do that. The Tesla cannon can be found in Fallout New Vegas, but there are quite a few changes. Although it does look the same, the firing sound has been altered, and the damage is different as well. There is no longer a big explosion, 
just to direct beam damage and residual damage on target. The beam now does 80 damage, and the residual damage is still at 20 for 2 seconds. That is a much higher beam damage than Fallout 3 to compensate for the lack of an explosion, but the residual damage is the same. The weapon is also a lot less durable than the Broken Steel variant, and consumes 5 electron charge packs per shot, making it a lot more demanding than before. There is a unique variant known as the Tesla Beaten Prototype, which looks very different from the vanilla version. Gone is the cold metal, and instead we get a rusted frame with yellow-orange glass, yellow tubes, and some extra wiring. The metal frame that I am just going to refer to as the barrel, for lack of a better term, is also very different looking, making the weapon shorter overall. The damage gets a small boost, doing 10 more damage over the base Tesla cannon, hitting for 90, and 5 more residual damage as well. This extra damage comes at a really big cost though, since it has half the weapon HP of the base weapon, meaning it can only fire 195 times before breaking, while also consuming more electron charge packs. This low HP is doubly problematic because it is one of the most expensive weapons to repair to 100%, costing over 20 thousand caps to go from broken to fully repaired. The weapon is found at a crashed vertebrate near the old nuclear test site, among the skeletons of the dead occupants. The vertebrate has Enclave markings, meaning that it is likely that the prototype was a project being conducted by the Enclave. The name is quite specific, and indeed, it is not an in-game reference, rather, it is apparently a reference to a web comic artist by the name of Kate Beaton who has an affinity for Nikola Tesla who appears in many of her comics. We don't have one, but two unique variants in Fallout New Vegas, thanks to that crazy old guy, Father Elijah. Elijah's jury-rigged Tesla cannon is identical to the Tesla beaten prototype, which is interesting, but the weapon is overall better. It does 85 damage compared to the 80 for the base weapon and 90 for the prototype, and 20 seconds of residual damage, just like the vanilla version. It is more durable than the prototype and consumes less ammo, making it really the best all-around option of the Tesla cannons. It also has no spread when firing, which makes it one of only two weapons like that, and the other weapon we will cover later. It is found at the Big MT, close to an area called Elijah's Watch, near a wooden platform. Be careful looting it, however, because once you grab the weapon, it will cause some berserk Securitrons to spawn, and you'll get to test that baby out right away. Now, I do want to address the appearance of the weapon, namely that it is identical in every way to the beaten prototype. Rather than some sort of happenstance that caused Elijah to modify a Tesla cannon to look exactly like the prototype cannon, I think it is much more probable that Elijah somehow got his hands on another prototype and made his own modifications. Also, despite the jury-rigged part of the name, this weapon cannot be repaired with any other weapon even when you have the jury-rigged perk. So, thanks for that bit of false advertisement, Obsidian. The ever-so-controversial Creation Club makes the Tesla Cannon available for Fallout 4, although the weapon cannot be found anywhere in the base game. The appearance is exactly like Fallout 3 or Base New Vegas, although it now fires fusion cells since electron charge packs are not even in Fallout 4. Exact numbers are hard to come by, but it's still a very powerful weapon, with the ability to arc electricity across multiple targets. The description says the cannon was designed pre-war, which we already knew that, and was meant as a lightweight, anti-tank weapon, which seems again to confirm the anti-vehicle nature of this weapon. Looking at how the weapon may operate, I think the most probable method is similar to the LAER in New Vegas. It is obvious that there is a huge electric charge that fires straight towards a target. But how do you cause electricity to fire in a straight line? How do you keep electricity from arcing to a more conductive object between you and your target? Well, there may be a laser that fires to the target, turning the air in its path into a plasma, which is very conductive. The electricity can then flow along the line of plasma to the target, and this is known in the real world as an electrolaser. The LAER is known to use this technology because, well, it's in the name, Laser Assisted Electrical Rifle. However, the Tesla Cannon doesn't give any hints as to how it works. The design itself looks quite original, and I couldn't find a direct design inspiration in pop culture or real-world examples. But please, if you know of one, let me know in the comments. 
I always look forward to getting this weapon in my playthroughs because it is so satisfying to blow up vertebrates in Fallout 3 and the reloading animation in third person is really well done. I do want to point out something that has been bugging me though. In Fallout 3, you can't encounter the weapon until after you recover the Tesla coil, implying that the Brotherhood was not able to use any of these Tesla cannons without this coil. Then in New Vegas, it is confirmed that the design is pre-war, and there is no similar modification necessary in New Vegas to make the Tesla cannon work. So what's the deal here? I find it very unlikely that all the Capital Wasteland examples were all non-functioning and broken whereas the ones out west seem to all work fine. One explanation would be that the Tesla coil greatly increased the cannon's abilities, which that's a fine justification, but I still think it's weird that you can't even equip a Tesla cannon until after you get the Tesla coil for the Brotherhood. The whole quest seems to imply that the cannon was completely non-functional without this new part. I'm not done with the Tesla cannon yet though, because there is one more cool thing about the Tesla cannon Namely that it was not first conceptualized in Fallout 3, no, it was meant to be included in the design documents for Fallout Brotherhood of Steel 2. Yes, the sequel to what is widely regarded as the worst Fallout game to date. It was meant to be a so-called uber weapon, which was one of a handful of weapons that would need to be assembled by the player through the course of the game. It would require a plasma cannon, Tesla coils, quote, an unlicensed nuclear reactor core, Pip-Boy bounding glue, and a steam line? I don't really know what those last two are, but I do want to know why an unlicensed reactor core is needed instead of a licensed one, I guess. This weapon was actually meant to be a plasma cannon, not some sort of electrical weapon, simply modified with Tesla coils to increase damage. And this is the image used in the design docs for the cannon. Ugh, beautiful. All right, the next several weapons all have one thing in common, and that is that they are not made by human hands. That's right, we're gonna talk about some alien stuff. Although most people associate Fallout's aliens with the Mothership Zeta DLC, aliens and their technology have been a part of the series since the very first game. The alien blaster has been present in every major Fallout game since the very first one. In the first Fallout, it can be only obtained by finding the Crashed Alien Ship Special Encounter. A Crashed Alien Ship with two unusually proportioned bodies can be found, with one of them carrying the Vaunted Alien Blaster. This weapon has the highest single shot damage potential in the entire game, with a base damage between 30 and 90. It also has a very high ammo capacity, being able to fire 30 times before reloading and does electrical type damage. This just sounds way too good to be true, and indeed it almost is. All these great things are tempered by the abysmal range. With a range of only 10 hexes, you will need to make sure that you are up close and personal to use this weapon at all. The same exact alien blaster is found in Fallout 2, and the stats are also identical. The blaster is available in two ways. One involves the special encounter with Willy, who is a special weapons trader around Modoc. Upon encountering Willy, he will go on to read a long-winded, written speech that makes your character fall asleep. Upon awaking, Willy will ask you if you want to buy the weapon, but since you fell asleep, you don't know what weapon he is offering. Clicking the barter button in the dialogue window, or pickpocketing him, will show what weapon he is selling, because it's not always an alien blaster. For $10,000, the weapon can be yours, or you can get it from the Enclave. In the puzzle trap room, there are a number of terminals, and one randomly selected terminal, when repaired, will yield the weapon. It's a lot more complicated than that though, since you have to have the speech skill tagged and over 100%, and you can't have science, repair, outdoorsman, gambling, throwing, first aid, doctor, or trap skills tagged. Why these super specific requirements? really only Adam knows, but it confirms that the Enclave have alien technology and the best thing they can think to do with it is to stash it away in some random box, thereby proving once again that the Enclave are the dumbest smart people in all of Fallout 2. The blaster has the same effectiveness as in the first Fallout, but the introduction of some electrical resistant creatures like floaters means you have to know when you need to holster it. 
The design of the weapon is pretty great, having a similar design to the Pulp Fiction sci-fi ray guns of the earlier 20th century. I did not find a direct design inspiration here either, but if you know of one, please leave a comment. There's a critical question here though in regards to the Fallout and Fallout 2 alien blaster. Why does it accept small energy cells? It is unlikely that the weapon was changed to use human energy storage devices, especially because the one is looted off the body of an alien. Rather, it would seem more likely that small energy cells are copied alien tech, or maybe derived from it, and therefore we are able to use energy cells in the alien blaster. That is not confirmed lore. It is merely conjecture based on the alien blaster using small energy cells. But we do know there is a precedent, and that alien technology has been studied and copied more than once in the Fallout universe. So it's within the realm of possibility. The next time we see the alien blaster is in Fallout 3, and it is in a new form. It is still a very powerful weapon, dealing 100 base damage with a fast rate of fire. But more importantly, it has a 100% critical hit chance. Getting a headshot with the Alien Blaster is a surefire way to take down very strong enemies quickly. However, like before, it does come with some limitations. It can only fire 125 shots from full condition before it breaks, which is not great. Although you won't see the gun jam until you are about 5 shots away from breaking. The most limiting factor is a change in the ammo from the small energy cell to the new alien power cell. These blue glowing tubes are in short supply. 120 can be found at the alien crash site where the alien blaster is also found. More can be found at Fort Bannister and Fort Independence, but there are only around 362 total in the core game. Mothership Zeta has 365 possible power cells, and rather surprisingly, Broken Steel has the most with 425. You just gotta love it when the Enclave have more alien power cells than the alien mothership. Another blaster can be found at the mobile base crawler in the Broken Steel add-on with a bunch of power cells, likely being a reference to Fallout 2 where an alien blaster can be recovered from the oil rig. The unique variant known as the Fire Lance looks identical to the alien blaster with some altered characteristics. It does 20 less damage, but can do an additional base 10 fire damage as it sets targets alight for 5 seconds. It has the same insane critical chance, but even worse HP, and I'm meaning way worse, as it can only fire 63 times before breaking from full condition. Wow, that is awful. The Fire Lance is notorious for how it's found, since it is tied with a random encounter. That should sound simple enough were it not for the fact that the random encounter involves a crashing UFO that blows up in the air and sends the fire lance and a bunch of alien power cells flying everywhere. There is a very good chance that the fire lance gets lost due to this and an even higher chance of not recovering all the power cells. The special encounter only happens once, so if you hear a craft come whizzing by and an explosion, check all NPCs in the area and tell Dogmeat to go find any weapons close by. The name of the weapon is from the Wasteland game, which Fallout owes a lot of its identity to. And, well, it's not exactly the game where it comes from, rather a companion book called Wasteland Paragraphs that mentions an alien weapon called the Fire Lance that sets enemies on fire. The last unique variant isn't anything like the original Blaster or Fire Lance, with the exception that they share the same model. It is the Captain's Sidearm, it is much shinier, and like the name implies, is wielded by the captain of the Zayton mothership, and can be looted off the captain's body after defeating them. Rather than firing one bolt, it fires six, almost like an alien shotgun, although it is very hard to tell unless firing at long ranges. Due to that, the bolts do less damage at 35, but if all bolts happen to strike the target, this hits really hard. The weapon also does not use alien power cells, Rather, Alien Power Modules, which was introduced in the Mothership Zeta DLC and can only be found in the DLC. The weapon can also be repaired with Alien Atomizers, which is a whole different weapon that is found all over the DLC, making repairing a lot easier. This weapon also has much higher HP than any other Alien Blaster, maybe because it hasn't been involved in a crash or an explosion like the normal Alien Blaster or the Fire Lance, making this quite a formidable weapon. 
Fallout New Vegas is the only other game that has the same exact alien blaster from Fallout 3, to the surprise of literally no one. The blaster will only be available if the player chooses the Wild Wasteland perk, otherwise the encounter location will have a raider with a unique Gauss rifle instead. In the encounter, an alien captain and two subordinates can be seen, and upon killing them, the blaster can be looted off the captain's body, as well as over 100 alien power cells. It does less damage than in Fallout 3 at 75, most likely for balance, but still has the 100% critical multiplier, as well as the rare effect of zero spread, which only applies to this weapon and the aforementioned Tesla cannon. Interestingly, the durability of the blaster in New Vegas is very high, and it would take over 2,000 shots from fully repaired to broken, which far exceeds the total amount of alien power cells available in the game. Another interesting note is that the weapon can be repaired with the jury rigging perk using simple laser pistols. And the two subordinate aliens with the captain at the encounter are also wielding laser pistols themselves. Now I want to hear all your guys' alien laser pistol conspiracy theories. The Fallout 3 in New Vegas Alien Blaster once again pays homage to the Pulp Fiction era ray guns. And just googling ray gun shows many that bear a strong resemblance. I thought this one was particularly interesting because of the design overlaps, but the artist that created this ray gun did so in a steampunk design, and this was happening around the same time that Fallout 3 came out in 2008. One thing I do want to mention is the Fallout 3 concept art for the Alien Blaster, because there was one concept that was just 10 pounds of crazy in a 5 pound sack. This shall we say pistol did not start out as a pistol. No, it was a tiny alien craft that was found and then altered with a pistol grip to turn into a pistol. It doesn't stop there though, because it comes complete with a tiny alien that gets a little electrical shock when the trigger is pulled, which forces him to press a button to fire the ship turned pistol's blaster, making it work just like any other weapon. That is some men in black stuff right there. You know how I said the Fallout 3 and New Vegas blaster was specific to those games? I lied, and I don't even feel bad about it. This blaster can again be found in Fallout 4, but cannot be equipped or used by the player. Rather, this blaster is wielded by the animatronic aliens that are found in Nuka World, but they do fire, they do do damage, and they're even modeled and textured for third and first person use if the player equips the item with console commands. It is interesting they went through all the trouble to model the weapon and bring it into Fallout 4 when you can't even use it. It also makes you wonder what Nuka-Cola knew about aliens since they modeled the Zaytans and their weapons perfectly. With that aside, the actual Fallout 4 blaster looks much different and a bit more modern. It's not as Buck Rogers as the previous blaster. It does a respectable amount of energy damage, but no longer has the critical hit effect because of how Fallout 4 changed the critical system. It can only be found with an injured alien during the UFO special encounter, where a UFO is seen smoking across the sky and crashing. The alien seeks refuge in a cave and is immediately hostile should the player find the crashed craft and go into the cave. The weapon uses alien blaster rounds, which look similar to the power cells of 3 in New Vegas, and there are only a maximum of 600 possible in the base game. I really like that the limited ammo was a consideration by the devs, because the player has the option to upgrade the blaster to accept fusion cells, taking a small hit to the damage output. What I don't like is that even with this mod attached, the reloading animation still shows the player unloading and reloading an alien blaster cell. Come on Bethesda, if you're gonna commit to something, commit. Shooting a blue bolt, the projectile speed is frightfully slow similar to plasma weapons and can make it difficult to use at range. The weapon can also be modified with several upgrades, including a long barrel, an improved grip, and even scopes. And they all somehow have the exact same look and aesthetic as the main gun. Maybe we can chalk this up to the Soul Survivor being a perfectionist and spending hour after grueling hour making that funky scope look exactly how the rest of the gun looks. Who are we kidding here? He makes a scope for a pipe pistol that uses a couple nails and calls it good. There's no way he's making these alien upgrades from scratch. 
There is one unique variant that can be obtained from the hubologists in Nuka World, known as Hub's Alien Blaster. That is right, this blaster apparently belonged to the original Dick Hubble, the creator of hubology and ancestor of Dara Hubble, whom the player meets outside of Nuka World. Assisting the hubologists with their quests, Trip to the Stars, will reward the player with this weapon, which is identical to the Vanilla Blaster in every way, except that it pays its respects to the Fallout 3 and New Vegas Blasters by having double critical damage and filling the critical meter 15% faster. I also think the implications of Dick Hubble, the Hubology founder, actually having a piece of real alien technology, super interesting. Maybe they were right all along. Okay, locking on to the Neurodiamond. Oh, there were so many of them. What have you been doing? Good, good. Good. The Zeta rays are withering them. Well, some of them at least. And we're done. For now. You'll need many more treatments. Congratulations. You are now an AHS. Uh, yeah, never mind. Fallout 76 has the blaster from Fallout 4, with the same look and slightly lower damage. It comes with all the same mods, so the fusion magazine comes in clutch once again, and the weapon is found in the toxic pond within a sunken safe, as well as being a display item at Purveyor Murmurg's, Murmurg, Murmurg's, Murmurg's shop, even though she no longer sells it. There's also the chance of picking one up from the many alien encounters during the periodic Invaders from Beyond events. The mod for the Fusion Mag as well as some alien power cells can be found at the Black Mountain Ordnance Works, meaning that there was pre-war effort to make a fusion cell conversion. There's one unique variant in 76 as a reward from the Wastelanders update for completing the Mission Out of Control quest. It is the same as the vanilla, but has three preset legendary effects. Once again, all related to criticals. It has the medic effect, which heals you and your teammates on a VAT's critical strike, as well as two lucky perks, which each add 50% more damage to critical hits for a total of 100. I think that is a nice callback. I didn't find any direct inspiration for the design of this blaster. Although the base weapon is very different from Fallout 3 in New Vegas, it starts to look a lot more like the older version once the long barrel and scope are attached. So maybe there's a connection there. The alien atomizer was introduced in Mothership Zeta and is a very common weapon wielded by the Zetans. Due to this, it is actually fairly weak. At least it's nowhere near as strong as the blaster. Doing 35 damage, it is powered by the alien power module like the captain's sidearm and has respectable durability. Although they are common, they can be sold for around 500 caps for a fully repaired unit. So, if you're needing some caps, loading up on some atomizers and selling it to the merchants back down on Earth is a good get-rich-quick scheme. There is one unique variant, or I guess technically I should say two, the so-called Atomic Pulverizer. Two of this same weapon can be found right next to each other, making it a unique, unique weapon if you follow my meaning. It does only two more points of damage, but reduces the AP cost per shot to just 12 points making it a very capable VATS weapon. It can be found in the weapons lab, locked behind a door with a terminal that needs 75 science skill to activate. The terminal can blow up though if damaged, so watch your fire so you don't accidentally destroy it. The atomizer is available in Fallout 4 through, drum roll please, oh, never mind, I don't have sound effects, the Creation Club. It is part of the Zayton Arsenal, which will be mentioned again later, but has an atomizer that overall looks just like a reskinned and higher fidelity atomizer from Fallout 3. It is no longer chrome, but a gunmetal gray and red-brown combo. It can also get a lot of upgrades, similar to the blaster, and does a whopping 171 damage, which is over three times the base damage of the blaster. This is not consistent with Fallout 3, where it was the more common and weaker option between it and the blaster. The design is much different from the other alien weapons we have seen so far. It appears to be two weapons put together actually, with just one upside down, which is made even more clear when firing the weapon in third person. The game files have two identical versions in the game files that are only differentiated by their IDs and sometimes these weapons will randomly spawn in the game. Like many of Fallout 3's assets, this weapon is also in the New Vegas game files, but it's never used. 
Another weapon that was introduced in Mothership Zeta is the Alien Disintegrator, a more powerful weapon used by alien soldiers. Hitting for 65 damage, it has good durability, but the real standout attributes are the reload and the clip, magazine, battery, whatever we want to call it, capacity. It can be fired 100 times before needing to reload. And when you need to reload, you just press a button. Wow, I press a button to make my in-game character press a button to instantly reload. I think we have reached peak gaming. I guess all the alien power modules that power the weapon are stored inside the disintegrator itself. I can't really think of any other way that it would work. There is one unique variant, the destabilizer, which has its damage cut in half, but it's automatic. Although the durability is increased to make it viable, it also has a higher AP cost and is less accurate than the base disintegrator while having the same DPS. There really isn't a reason to use this over the base weapon unless your perk loadout favors the destabilizer. It is found in the weapons lab shooting range, and if you don't pick it up the first time, then you likely won't get another chance since the teleporters are the only way to get there. The disintegrator was added in Fallout 76 as part of the Invaders from Beyond update and is commonly used by aliens. The damage is again a little disappointing, but it accepts a handful of mods, like an automatic receiver, basically turning it into the destabilizer unique weapon. It is interesting to note that the disintegrators wielded by the aliens are different, as they have different fire rates and reload speeds. The disintegrator is available in Fallout 4 due to being part of the Zayton arsenal in the Creation Club and has the same brown, red, and gunmetal color scheme as the Atomizer. It also does way less damage than the Atomizer at 55. So the Creation Club really just does whatever it wants to, doesn't it? I have to say, I think it's really funny how vendors can all seem to repair these alien weapons even though it's supposed to be the super advanced alien technology. Way to go Moira, you secret genius. The Sonic Emitter is a special weapon first introduced in the Old World Blues add-on from New Vegas. This pistol-shaped energy weapon is unique because it can be altered or reprogrammed to have different effects. This is kind of a trick though, since there is no basic Sonic Emitter that accepts modifications. Rather, there are five different Sonic Emitters, and the models just get changed out. The Sonic Emitter was created by Dr. 8 at the Big Mountain Research Facility before the Great War, and underwent further development in the post-war era. This was mostly in the development of different frequencies that are used to give the Sonic Emitter new properties. These upgrades are scattered across Big Mountain, and can only be applied by Blind Diode Jefferson in the sink. The first version of the weapon we will look at is Gabriel's Bark Emitter, which is found in one of Gabe's dig spots in the X8 research facility. This modification changes the color of the sonic emitter to brown, does 55 damage, and has a special knockback effect. The Opera Singer emitter is found in Dr. 8's living quarters, changes the emitter to red, does the same damage as Gabriel's bark, but has a dismembering effect instead. The Revelation emitter is given to the player by Dr. Klein, and is a really nice blue color that does significantly reduce damage at 31, but it has the special ability to paralyze targets for 10 seconds, which can be very useful. The Robo-Scorpion emitter is found in the giant Robo-Scorpion room, does a lot more damage at 65 per shot, and an additional 100 explosive damage, making this a very potent weapon. The last version, the Tarantula Sonic emitter, is a fantastic purple color, and is found in Higgs Village, and will set targets alight for 5 seconds, doing 2 damage every second. All these different versions of the sonic emitter look the same, except for the color that is shown on the oscilloscope. The overall design is very cool. I love the oscilloscope in the back, as well as the vacuum tubes on top. It is similar to a lot of the weapons we have discussed, and I don't have a direct design inspiration. No matter what version you use, they are all extra effective against robots and power armor, and the sonic emitters have a unique firing sound that I like a lot. The emitters can be upgraded with the vertebrae pulse desensitizer frequency that powers down force fields of which there are many at Big Mountain. Whenever you change the frequency of the sonic emitter, you get a new version at 90% health. So if you ever need to repair the weapon, just go swap out the frequency and bam, you have a mostly repaired sonic emitter. This weapon, more than any other one for some reason, makes me feel like I'm using a real Pulp Fiction weapon. And I think that comes down to the design, 
the way the pulse looks and the sounds it makes when firing, as well as the different effects that it can have, because these effects really are just Fallout science magic. Another unique New Vegas weapon, the Euclid's Sea Finder, can be very easily overlooked, and even if it isn't, a new player may have no idea what to do with it. This weapon, if you want to call it that, looks like a colorful child's toy, but was actually developed by Poseidon Energy before the Great War. This unassuming pistol is actually the targeting device for a huge orbital laser platform that appears to be geostationary since it can be used at any time within some constraints, but I'll go into that in a second. The Sea Finder was originally at the Helios 1 power plant, which is a valuable solar power plant that is also the control station for the Archimedes laser satellites. The Brotherhood of Steel was the earliest known faction to have taken the facility, but they never came into possession of the Sea Finder, and when they heard of its existence, they assumed it must have been scavenged by someone else since the events of the Great War. The Sea Finder was indeed picked up by some unknown individual and traded hands several times until it ended up in the hands of a man who was being controlled by Father Elijah to buy the item from Sarah Weintraub in Vault 21. After buying the weapon, the man tries to remove the slave collar that Father Elijah put on him to force him to complete this task and accidentally making the collar go off and result in a cranial reconfiguration. That's fancy talk for he dead. The Sea Finder was picked up by a street urchin in Freeside, where he can be found chasing his friend, play shooting at him with his shiny new toy. That is how the player can finally come into possession of the Sea Finder, by buying it or stealing it from some random kid in Freeside. The effects are extremely impressive, as the Sea Finder communicates with satellites to designate a location that gets completely incinerated in a pillar of blue energy. This can only be done outdoors, and only once a day, where presumably the satellite must recharge before being used again. You don't ever see it reloaded, although it does technically take ammo called the Archimedes II charge, which is automatically placed in the player's inventory 24 hours after the last use. The ammo normally can't be viewed, but the model is just like the alien power cell, just yellow instead of blue. The laser does 150 base explosive damage, with a fairly large area of effect, making it good for a group of enemies, although it does take around 5 seconds from trigger pull to the touchdown of the laser. When the trigger is pulled, there is an animation on the screen of the Sea Finder that shows some basic geometry, which is a reference to the weapon's name and how it works. In Euclidean geometry, named after good old Euclid the Greek mathematician, if you know the position of two points and the distance between them, you can figure out the position of a third unknown point. This triangle is formed by the known position of the satellite, the known position of the shooter, and the unknown position of the target. This unknown position gets painted by the sea finder, and a quick calculation, although not that quick because five seconds can be a long time when you want something dead, the satellite can shoot at the precise location designated. It is worth mentioning that pulling the trigger will alert enemies, even though there is no visible or audible cue, so don't think you can be sneaky and get the drop on enemies with this thing. It is also worth noting that the Archimedes satellites are named after the other famed Greek scientist, mathematician, and inventor who, as legend has it, created a heat death ray, so this is all just one giant Greek party. This weapon is emblematic of the game of New Vegas in many ways with the out-of-the-box mechanics because of this giant space laser. Having it tied in with a mission related to a previous location, Helios 1, where whatever you choose to do in that location has effects on whether or not you can actually use the weapon. Eventually finding the Sea Finder, because some little kid is chasing his friend around Freeside, and ultimately putting it all together to realize that this isn't some colorful toy, but a crazy pre-war instrument of death. And because of that, it is one of the most memorable weapons and it's one of my favorites, even if I don't use it all that much. I also don't appreciate the glitch where I fast travel and get blasted by the space laser three seconds later. One of my playthroughs is plagued by this bug, but I guess a bug like that is also emblematic of the game of New Vegas. Fallout 4's Automatron DLC introduced a new and visually interesting weapon, the Tesla Rifle. This is a post-war weapon, as the item description mentions it was cobbled together using a robot's arm-mounted weapon. It isn't very clear looking at the model which robot this supposedly came from, but the likeliest candidate would be the paramedic Protectron from Fallout 4 with the shocking arms. 
The rifle does 32 damage, which is not great, but it has the legendary lightning effect, which causes electricity to arc between enemies, so it can be great against a group. Be careful though, because it can also arc to friendly NPCs, although companions are thankfully immune. The weapon uses fusion cells and can be upgraded in a number of ways, including charging barrels and a so-called shotgun barrel, which just makes me ask so many questions. It can be found on Ivy's body after defeating her as part of the headhunting quest, which is part of the Automatron DLC. This actually has the highest damage per shot for all fusion cell powered weapons, and that coupled with the lightweight of fusion cells means that it is a great weapon for survival mode. The Tesla rifle also shows up in Fallout 76 in the same form, where it actually gets a buff to its damage which seems to be the exception to the rule. It has fewer upgrades and can rarely be dropped by Deathclaws, but the plan can be purchased from the Brotherhood of Steel vendor bot, Phoenix, in Watoga. There is a unique legendary called Nightlight that was a reward for the See the Light weekly challenge and has the Nocturnal, Rapid, and Perception legendary effects. The weapon has a very homemade and industrial vibe. You can even see that some electricity is routed in part by a jumper cable, which is an awesome addition. I also love the glass sphere in the middle where electricity is visible. Let's end this video with one of my favorite weapons from Fallout New Vegas, the Hollow Rifle. This weapon has a great backstory, being the brainchild of the slightly off skilter Father Elijah in his quest to infiltrate the Sierra Madre. Since the automated security systems in the Sierra Madre remove all weapons, Father Elijah used the knowledge and technology he acquired through his travels in the Mojave to make a weapon that would go undetected by the Sierra Madre security. Father Elijah used holotech that he scavenged from Big Mountain to construct this new weapon, knowing that the hologram technology wouldn't be flagged as a weapon. To this end, he used a grenade launcher, where the barrel was turned into a fusion cell holder so that a pumping mechanism could load the next fusion cell once the current one is spent. The hologram projector and scope are placed on top of the grenade launcher barrel where a concentrated bolt of hologram technology is shot from. The hollow rifle has a base 80 damage, but will do residual damage as well of 15 extra damage for 3 seconds, while also having a chance to have a small knockback effect. Somehow the hologram technology seems to stick and burn on the target. This may be a modification from Father Elijah since we don't see this with any other hologram. The weapon's durability is middle of the road, but it accepts 3 mods as well. Hollow Rifle Focus Optics increases damage by a hefty 25. The advanced calibration reduces spread by 0.25, and reinforced components increases the maximum condition of the rifle by 1.5%, so all combined make for a much more capable rifle. Your only option for repairs are vendors, eddy, or weapon repair kits, and even though they are not present in the game anywhere, Father Elijah does mention that he has built more than one. The hollow rifle is capable of more single shot damage than even the Tesla cannon, and only uses one fusion cell to do so, meaning that it is one of the most efficient in addition to being one of the hardest hitting weapons in the game. Since the design is makeshift, and depends on an existing weapon, the standard grenade launcher, there's not much to dissect in terms of the inspiration. Josh Sawyer mentioned this weapon specifically and stated that they had more plans for the hollow rifle, notably wanting to have the spent fusion cells appear burnt and smoking when ejected to drive home the impressive power of the weapon, but due to limitations, they couldn't do it. I think I've heard that one before. So that's it. I believe I have covered every energy weapon in the Fallout series to date. Energy weapons are some of my favorites in the entire game and really help set it apart for me. I would like to hear your thoughts on energy weapons in general, or more specifically, your thoughts about the weapons covered in this video. We still have a little left to do though, because I have my comment highlights for the Enclave Power Armor video and my Children of Adam video. But first, I want to thank all my lovely patrons on the screen now for heeding the call of Adam. So I have no specific comment from the Child of Adam build video, but overall people were quite positive. I know it is not normal content for my channel. But the shorter videos I do between my long form videos are meant to let me try new things. I have had many people ask about Fallout 4 builds or what my Rad King character uses, and so rather than repeatedly answer these questions, I just wanted to show you. 
Any video idea that doesn't really conform to my usual video content will be tried out in these smaller videos. So if that wasn't your cup of tea, don't worry because I'm still uploading my normal content. For my Enclave Power Armor video, several of you here and on Discord let me know that the claim that no X-01 Power Armor can be found in Fallout 76 was in fact wrong, as X-01 can be found being worn by Scorched Enclave members, as well as locked away in the White Springs bunker. I need to amend that claim now to say that there are no player accessible suits of X-01 in Fallout 76, since all the suits in White Springs are locked away, and the Scorched that are wearing X-01 cannot have their power armor looted. So the point still stands, in the sense that the only X-01 available for use by the player is crafted by the player, and maybe why it is inferior to Fallout 4. Now internet, do your thing and prove me wrong so I can admit defeat in a future comment highlight. Nathaniel Perry made a good comment about the X-01 power armor, and how there is a good chance that it was a technology demonstrator, similar to how modern day military contractors will show off their research and development efforts in a bid to get further investment or military contracts. I think this would apply to the X-01, given how few units existed pre-war and its advanced systems and protection. It would also explain why the military hadn't started producing it and using it in the war with China. A few of you like Easy here brought up the other conflict with the T-51 loading screen that claimed that T-51 was the most advanced pre-war armor, and that is the existence of T-60. I want to save the details of this for a video that will go over the T-60 specifically, but I also wanted to make sure I mention this because X-01 being pre-war was only part of the reason why that loading screen and claim was so problematic. Derek Anon also brought up the T-60 and speculated that it may have greater radiation resistance because the government might have foreseen a need for greater radiation resistance in the event of nuclear exchanges due to the Sino-American War. Now, I'm not talking about the Great War level of nuclear exchange, but maybe they were worried about tactical nuclear armaments that could have been used during their invasion of the mainland, and this led to an increased radiation resistance in the new T-60s. I like this line of speculation, and it would be cool to see armor and weapons that were starting to come out designed to help Americans fight in a nuked battlefield. More than a few of you made a comment about the Black Devil armor being made by Batman, and that gave me a good chuckle. I never thought about that until I saw your comments, but now I can't unsee it. Now I can only think of Batman when I see that armor. I'm the Enclave. The Wooden Technician brought up a good point, that magazine covers in Fallout 4 show Tesla armor, and so the technology or concept seems to be a pre-war one, which may mean that the Tesla armor technology is a lot older than we think. I'll go into this more in a future video because this is an interesting topic. That is it for this video but you can move the party over to my Discord channel where we like to nerd out about a lot of things, but mostly Fallout. I also have a Patreon if you want to contribute to Adam's Kingdom. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you in the next video.